I hope that uh, you have um, got some things that will help you in your families, in rearing your children, uh, things about marriage, relationship, how to make a good decision, uh, husband's responsibility, wife's responsibility. Uh, the Bible is so rich in teaching us about family life uh, and about um, how we are to get the best out of the relationships that we're in. One of the things that I have said to you repeatedly is that no matter what your relationship is, no matter what your marriage is like, God can save it. If it's good, he can make it better. He can enrich it and show you things that you have not yet learned, uh, you have not yet experienced. Uh, if it's not so well, he can fix that. There's absolutely nothing that the Lord cannot fix. There's nothing he cannot speak to. There's nothing he cannot touch and change and make different for you. But you got to be willing to follow him. Sometimes we must learn to follow him in places or two places that we don't necessarily want to go, but it will be necessary for us to go in order to bring health to the relationship or to make one's self healthy. So we want to go back into some things and, and some much of what I want to say is, is kind of a repeat on some things, ideas. I just want to make sure that you did get it. If uh, you didn't, we'll say it one more time for you in hopes that you will capture it this last time. But before I get into that, let me begin by saying there was an article that was written uh, about men and women by Dr. Joyce Brothers, who asked the question, are men and women so different? And then she responds by saying that they really are different. And brothers and sisters, the differences between men and women are so evident. She says, I have spent months talking to biologists and neurologists and geneticists and research psychologists and psychiatry, psychiatrists. And she says, what I have discovered is that men and women are more different than I have ever, ever known. She goes on to say that their bodies are different. Their minds are different. They're different from the various compositions of their blood, all the way up to the way that their brains are developed. And that means, brothers and sisters, that both men and women think and experience life from different vantage points, from different perspectives. God created us and made us that way. One thinks one way, the other thinks another way, but if you put them both together, it's the right way. It's the right way. So that means neither one or the other is wrong. What makes it wrong is when you don't have that other to put it to, and you spend your days trying to figure it out. Dr. Paul Promenos said, and I quote, he says, men and women differ in every cell of their bodies. He says this difference is in the chromosomal combination, which is the basic cause of the development of maleness and femaleness, as each case would be. He said that women have greater vitality perhaps because of the chromosomal differences. Normally they will live, outlive rather, men three to four years. And then he says women's blood contains more water, 20% for red cells. And since these red cells is what is used to provide oxygen that goes to the brain, if women have 20% fewer red cells than does the men, then it means that they are, they are weaker. And they are more prone to faint and to fall out much quicker than the man. So uh, with that being in mind, if brothers are falling out and fainting all the time, something right with that. That's all I'm saying. So basically what I'm saying is that when we look at us, when we look at the genders, when we look at male and female, 
there is a basic, vital, fundamental, psychological, physiological, chemical, chromosomal difference between men and women. And these differences that we have that is between us, God has made them not by accident, but he's made them on purpose because it is within this combination of differences between male and female uh, that God is able to create a unit of family that is to be very much like himself. Now, with that in mind, it takes us over to, we're going to go back over to the book of Ephesians and again look at the responsibility list that is given to us. Last Sunday, I talked to you about the love bank and putting something in because you can't, you can't make withdrawals on love if you're not making deposits to love. And uh, as it would be with any other particular thing or situation in life, if you want to get something from it, uh, it means you got to put something into it. You don't go to the bank and try to withdraw money that you haven't deposited. And so it is the same in our relationships one with the other. Brothers, you're going to have to learn how to love your wives, and wives, you're going to have to learn how to love your husband, and when you make deposits into that, then when hardships come, it's easier to get through the hardships and the difficulties of relationship when you have made much deposit of love. Amen? Amen. Because it is the thing that helps brings us through or soothe the situations sometimes when it is difficult. Now, according to the scriptures, and I can only speak to you, brothers and sisters, as to what the Bible says. You take the Bible, you take it home, you read it, you interpret it, hopefully through the gift of the Holy Spirit as he gives you that. And you begin to live that out and make it a reality, make it real in your lives. I'm hoping that I can say some things this morning and recount some things that will give you some ideas of what we as individuals should be doing. And these are the words of Paul. This is what he says in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. We'll start here. Verse 21, again, he says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. And brothers and sisters, you got to understand this thing is not about you. It's not about him. It's not about her. It's about God. It's about God. In every step of the way in one's relationship, it is all about God honoring God and if you keep that in mind and that becomes the forefront of your thoughts then you're already light years ahead of this thing as far as being successful in your relationship it's not about you it's not about her it's about God and keep in mind I told you that the covenant that we enter into is God's covenant is God's agreement so when one enter into Christian marriage, because there are all kinds of marriages I'm learning now that people have, even though it's God's design, some people enter into the design, but they don't enter in with God in mind. But for those of us who are Christian and Christian marriages, then this is what God gives to us as rules and ways for how we are to be successful within the marriage relationship. So it is submitting oneself, uh, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And what that simply means are the things that I choose to do, the thing that I'm going to do, the thing I desire to do, not only do I believe that it is going to be a blessing to my husband but it, or a blessing to my wife, but it's also going to bless God himself. What I do, I do it in the name of the Lord. I do it in the fear of God. I do it because I reverence God. And sometimes you find yourself having to put forth and do certain things that necessarily the flesh does not want to do. Simply because you love God. And see, so you got to get beyond the flesh. You got to get beyond your feelings. You got to get beyond your emotions and you got to start serving and loving each other in that realm where God himself exists. And you say, well, I fear God. 
and you say, I love God, and you say, I, I, I respect God. And so it's because of that or out of that that we begin to love each other or serve each other or do for each other or going beyond one own emotions and feelings to see to it that the other person is secured in whatever fashion and form that may be. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, that's where it all begins. Then Paul begins to break it down. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Again, you see how this passage of scripture and how the, 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 the context of his teaching is all referencing God. It's all about God. It's all about not how you feel, but how you feel about him. Submitting yourselves one to another in the what? Fear of God. Wives, submitting yourselves unto your own husband as what? unto the Lord. And then for the husband who is, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Uh, the church is the head of the church of the, uh, and is the savior of the body. Therefore the church is subject, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husband. It is in this picture that Paul paints for us that the women or the wives picture church. You are his, he looks at you and you are a emblem of what the church is. And he's saying that, he, he says that uh, the husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. And he says that the, the wife is to be subjected. And that word subjected simply means to obey. Obey is not a bad word. It's a good word. It is that the, the wife should be under subjection of her husband to obey her husband as, uh, as, 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 as Christ is over the church. Let me read it for you again. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ. The church main responsibility and duty is to obey the Lord. That's what we do. All of us have that in our hearts, or should. That's how we separate and we know the difference between uh, people who simply go to church, people who are the church. Because people who are the church obey Christ. You can't be saved and continue to live in sin. As some oppose and some say that it's okay to do that. When you get saved, that Jesus washes away all your sins as though you're heaven bound and you have no responsibility. You don't have to worry about anything. You're saved and it's okay. That's not necessarily the truth. When you get saved and you get sanctified, a change takes place in your heart. And God takes out the dirty and puts in something that is clean. He takes out the stone and gives you some flesh, something that you can feel, something that you can obey. We are to obey him. And listen, our righteousness is not in our church attendance. Our righteousness is in our obedience to Christ. And so he says, as the church which is all of us, is subject and to obey Christ, the wives are to be subject and obey their husbands. Then give a one amen on that. But hey, I'll take it. I'll take that, put it in my back pocket. I might need it tomorrow. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Then give a one amen, but that's okay. One is better than zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't know why we tend to have such a poor attitude when we talk about these passages of Scripture. It is as if we have missed the preceding parts of the verse where we are all under the authority of God. And though he says the wives are subject to their husband to obey their husbands, uh, I think I know why the problem exists. And people have. 
why there's such a frown sometimes when we talk about obeying husbands. And I'm going to put it here. I'm going to put my pen right here. Then I'm going to... I'm going to jump on this. I'm going to jump out of this. I was thinking about this this week because many times when I'm teaching, preaching, my thoughts go back over my lessons. My thoughts go back over what I've taught. And, and the Holy Spirit says something else to me that I felt was profound and I need to go back and say that. The reason that we have so much problem, whether you agree or you disagree with what I'm saying, is because we, we often, very often, marry the wrong people. Yeah, could be. You got it right this time, girl. You lucky. I'm blessed. I'm, you blessed, not lucky. But we often find that people marry the wrong people. Just because he says I'm a Christian doesn't make him one. And we don't do the work that is needed to be done to, to, to investigate to, to, to know whether or not Christ is in his heart. We find people that we like. Regardless as to whether or not we know in, in our heart that he's Christian. And we, we commit ourselves to that person. And then we try to take the word of God and make it work on something that will never work. Because he told you from the beginning, don't be unequally yoked. And we have too many unequal yoke relationships. That's why it cannot work. And if it is working, it's a struggle from day one. Why? Because Christ is not in his heart. Amen. And then when I'm teaching on it, you want to look at me with a funny eye. Uh-huh. As if what I'm saying, that, that ain't really how it is. That's exactly how it is. What you were in, you should have never been in. What you committed to, you should have never committed to. And that's why you're finding difficulties to submit to him. Because the real him showed up. And so when the... So when the Bible says submit to your own husband and you find out your husband is the cousin of the devil or distant relative of Satan it's difficult to submit to that. Yes! Then the question comes up but what am I to do in this situation when it's so mismatched? Can I get out of it? No! God gives us the grace of guiding us through how to work in relationships like that. You say, well, well, it's, he's not saved. But see, now you're in it. And God takes marriage serious. He takes covenant relationship serious. And he would much rather for you to have to deal. Now, nobody wants to go through hardships. But he would much rather deal with the hardships in hope that your salvation will bring him to the grace of God and he gets saved. That's more important than for him to, to love you in the way you want him to love you. What God wants is for him to get saved. So he's saying that it's a mismatch relationship, it's unequally yoked, but, but, but he'll use you to be a witness to him in hopes that he will see Christ before it is everlasting or eternally too late, he can come. Listen to me. Y'all wake up. You with me? It's never too late to come to Christ. It's never too late to come to Christ. As long as there's a beat in your chest, as long as there's a thump in your chest, as long as your heart is pumping blood, and there's some sign of life and consciousness, it's never too late to come to Christ. 
Now, I don't particularly, you know, teach or believe that one should wait till they get to the end of life and come to Christ. Only a fool will do that. Mm -hmm. and, and then you miss out on all of the joys and all of the wonder and all of the beauty that God would have created in your life if you had come to him in the first place. You spend your life trying to create something you'll never have. Rather than coming to him and letting him just by grace give it to you. And just freely let him make of your life the blessing that he can do and he alone can do. I don't, I don't ever encourage anyone to wait to the last minute to come to Christ. But I don't want to count nobody out. Mm -hmm. That uncle that you thought was that, that went to hell, you just may see him in glory. Because it, all it takes is, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, have mercy on my heart. Lord, have mercy. Who knows? He may have uttered those words right before he fell into eternal sleep. You don't know. I don't know. People are in accidents and they, all you know is that he's died. But you don't know what the last words are. And then sometimes we can communicate something to God and we don't even speak it. He's just already, and I'm going to tell you, God loves you to that degree. God loves you to that point that he will go to the end. He will stand at the edge. He will stand out on the periphery of time waiting on you to make a confession to come to him. He's not waiting for time to run out so he can say, oh yeah, I got enough in hell. No, God stands to the last nano of a second waiting on a confession so he can pull you back from the death of hell and bring you back. Now, I don't know what kind of life and what rewards. You may not have any rewards, but at least you're not in hell. This is a message of hope for the family. My God. I'm telling you, God wants to save his people. He wants to save your family. He wants to save your marriage. He wants to save your relationship. And so because he loves you so much and he loves you to that degree, we can't discount anyone. God loves them. And so he will use you. Though you made a misstep, a misjudgment, a miscalculation, the wrong decision in your covenant relationship, but I encourage you to stay in it. Because maybe you're not getting the love you want from it, but if you can be a witness to it, you can save his life or save his soul. I don't know when that will happen. Hopefully tomorrow. Hopefully the, hopefully the day when you get home. <laughs> but if not, stay firm in your faith. Amen. That means if you can't love him from your, your feelings, how you feel about him, you have to love him from your faith. Because you entered into this relationship in the fear of God. Amen. And you have to learn to love him as, as you love God. But all of this, brothers and sisters, speaks to the fact that whenever we talk about women submitting themselves to their husbands and women, wives being subjected to their husband, he said to be subjected to your husband as the church is subject to Christ, which means the church is subject to obey Christ. And, and ladies, you are subject to obey your husbands. Listen, I said to you, find someone... Brothers, listen. Find someone that will follow you. Ladies, listen. Find someone that you will follow. Here's another. Brother, find someone who will obey you. This whole road just got up and left. Watch it now, because the second row get ready to leave too. <laughs> find someone who will obey you. Ladies, find someone that you are willing to obey. And if you have not found that person, don't marry that person. Don't marry someone that you feel that you have to be 
in competition with. This is not about competition. The Bible is in Genesis, he didn't tell, he didn't give Eve to Adam so that she can compete with him. She gave Eve to Adam so that he can com she can complete him. And you got to understand that no matter who you marry in life, find someone that you can complete. Not someone that you compete with. If you marry him, everything he has is yours anyway. He got a car, you got one. You don't need the Bible to prove that. You can just go to the courts. You don't have to have no Bible to do, to do that. Just go downtown. Go to the courts. They start splitting stuff up. You get one house. He gets a house. You get the old car. I'm not leaving her with that old car. I'm giving her the new car. You can have had the money. To, the courts will do it. But we only been married for about six months. It doesn't matter. You signed the agreement. Whatever he has is yours. Whatever you have is here. You become one with each other. So while you're competing, take your positions and complete each other. Be subjected to your husband. You think the problem is the fact that he's not doing his part or she's not doing her part. The, that's not the problem at all. The problem may be in the fact that we're not doing it the way God say do it. And if you learn how to subject yourself to him according to as unto the Lord. You see you got to understand there are some battles you will fight you will always lose. But if you set back do your part do as unto the Lord and let the Lord fight your battles. He'll change his mind. Mm -hmm. He'll get a pain. Oh Lord Jesus. He'll get a pain and every time he think about it he gets that pain again. Oh Lord and the only way to make that pain go away is to treat you right. The Lord will fix it. He'll fix it. Every time he come around you, he starts crying. He don't know why he's crying. He just cries. Tears just come down. He just crying. Every time he walk away from you, the tears dry up. He can't cry if he wanted to cry. He walk back in your presence and he starts crying again. The Lord will fix it. What I'm saying is the power of the Lord, the power is in his hand. Quit trying to fight battles you cannot win. And do as unto the Lord. And let the Lord fight your battles. Even in a mismatch relationship. Even when it's unequal and it's not right. God, when he gets in it, he knows how to fix it. He's got to give him a chance. Glory to God. <laughs> so he says, listen, therefore as the church is subject unto the, a Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband. Let them obey their husband in everything. Not sometimes, not when you feel like it, not when it's convenient for you, but in everything. That means even when you don't agree, but you know, you understand he's the head. Listen, ladies, sometimes you have to let him make his mistake. Because he's not going to learn how to be head of anything. He's going to make some mistakes. He's going to have some faults. And you're going to have to let him make those mistakes and have those faults. And hopefully he'll learn from them and won't continue to repeat them. Mm -hmm. But that's how you learn. There's some things you can't learn in school. There are certain things that you can only learn on the job. There's something, you, you don't learn everything about how to be a great mother at the beginning of childbearing and childbirth. Even when your parents and those who love you and your grandparents and they all come around and they try to give you parts and bits of their own lives and from their experiences, you take some of that. Some of that you can use. A lot of that you need to dismiss. <laughs> I don't know who I'm talking to. But let me say it again. Some of that stuff you can use. A lot of that stuff you need to just mm -hmm, and dismiss that. Because it didn't work for them. And it ain't going to work. That's crazy. So 
But what I'm saying is that you, 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 you make your mistakes. Some things, there are no books. People write books all the time about parenting, write books all the time about relationship, write books all the time about marriage, marriages. But there are no two that are really the same. The experiences are going to be different because the people are different. And you just go, he's going to make his mistakes. I wish you would do it like my daddy. He can't do it like your daddy. Your daddy did it wrong for a hundred times and he got it right once. And now you want, I wish you would do it like my daddy. He just got it right. Come on, talk to me now. He's got to make his, he's got to make his own error. He's got to make his own mistake. And you got to give him room to do it. And you got to give him room to improve. It's not perfect. God is working on him. Oh, God is working on her. Your responsibility as to whatever he's doing, whatever the decision, is to obey him as unto the Lord. Let his voice be the final voice and the authority of your home. Can I say that again? Let his voice, which is the strong voice, the deep voice. Remember I told you last week, the exterior of you is not by happenstance. It's not, it's not by, uh, uh, you know, you just, it's not just you. You are made that way on purpose. The exterior, your heaviness of voice, the heaviness of your hand, the thickness of your skin, you know, all of the exterior of you is made for you to be a leader and to be a dreamer. You know, women talk, according to Howard University, women use more words than men. They talk more than men. And so you got to respect the fact that because you want to just yap, 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 and he just want to just kind of go off. He's thinking. <laughs> He's imagining things. He's creating thoughts of things in his head. He don't have to always boss it. And you have to know it. I told you he's different. And different on purpose. And he's thinking. So, so you know, just because he doesn't do all of the things you want to do. Let him be who he is. Let him, all of his, all of his characteristics proves that he is made to be head of the house. Even when he makes mistakes. Even when he makes missteps. He's still head of the house and you have to honor that and obey that. Because, listen. Don't ever forget when I say obey that, that it's all because of him. It's not about him. You obey that because it's about God. And God said it. Now, it's more difficult because you made a decision to marry somebody who doesn't really love God. But you got to show honor. You got to let him lead. You got to do some following. You got to pray a lot and you got to seek God a lot about how do you do this thing? How do I honor you and honor him when he doesn't know you? How do I do that? And, and oh, can I say that again? How, how, ladies, this is what you, you got to ask the Lord. How, how, do I, how do I honor you and honor him when he doesn't know you? How do I do that? I'm going to tell you something. It's not easy. But it doesn't deviate from the word of God when he says uh, when he says to obey him. It doesn't mean that you don't get to obey him or that you don't have to obey him because he doesn't know God. You made this thing happen. And God wants to use you in this thing to save him. Matter of fact, it becomes a double duty or a double responsibility on your part. Because not only do you have to obey him. And, 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 and follow him and let him be the head and, 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 and all those things according to the scriptures. You got to find a way to walk around him that demonstrates the power of the cross so that he can be drawn to Christ. And, and if you can do that, then all this other stuff will be made easy because the power of your relationship is found in the cross. Hmm. It's in the cross, in the cross. 
where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart it all rolled away. It's the cross. It was there by faith I received my sight. You see, you begin to see things different when you see the cross. And now, is what the songwriter said. And now, I am happy, yeah. All because of the cross. I'm happy all day. It's all because of the cross. It's in the cross, I'm telling you. And so you must not only be his wife, Write this down. Write this down. Not only must you be his wife, but you must also be his witness that draws him to the cross. In no way does he say leave him or leave her because they don't know him. You made that decision and God takes marriage. Woo. Very seriously. Give me about five or ten more minutes. I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to leave it alone. you know, Because I'm just telling you stuff y'all already know. Y'all smart people. I'm really just rehearsing something I need to practice myself. <laughs> and I was sharing with my wife. You know, I was talking. You know, it's interesting that when we rehearse this stuff and we talk about this stuff, I'm talking to me because I'm finding ways how to strengthen my own relationship. It's not just me preaching to you, but I've also found ways to where I've lacked. I've found ways where I need to, to bump it up so that now my wife asks me to do certain things, you know, I start thinking about what I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. You can't ask the people to humble themselves and I don't humble myself. I know you're the pastor. You're the pastor of the church. You're at home. I know you passed that home and you passed that church. I know you passed away wherever you go. But, but this is a different animal. This is a different thing. So that when she asks you, you, gotta, you too have to learn to humble yourselves and submit yourself to show the kind of love and make deposits in the love bank so that when she goes, she can draw something from it. Or when you go, you can draw something from it. Mm-hmm. I told her, or uh, rather I asked her, and I told, 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 not a good way to say it. <laughs> See, I've learned that. Don't be telling me. Can you ask sometimes? Well, that's what I meant. Well, you need to say what you mean. So I asked the other day because, I, you know, I run a lot, you know, my clothes get sweaty. I got certain ones that I run in all the time, and they get sweaty, and I'll let them dry, and I'll put them back on, and then they get to the point where, shoot, I'm, I can't stand me. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I have to run at night when there's no people. You'll get that later. So I asked her, I said, uh, can, you, uh, can, you, can you wash my, my running gear, all my stuff? Oh, yeah, I wash that for you. Now, I'm going to need it dry because I'm going to run again this afternoon. I got it. You see, I, I had something in, and now I can make a deposit. You know what I'm saying? Now, I don't know if she felt like washing. I don't know if she felt like doing all that and drying my stuff and, uh, you know, and all this stuff. You got to put extra downy in it. You know? <laughs> Y'all are getting it. Uh -huh. But she did so with such care and love and folded them up, put them up on the dresser so I can find them. I'm not running up and down the stuff trying to find all the stuff. Where's my hat? Where's this? No, just do it so long. And That's what I mean. You put something in, you got something to withdraw. Mm -hmm. The other day we were doing some stuff. I'm just giving you some little snippets of what goes on in the Coleman house. The other day she comes downstairs. <clears throat> I'm standing there with my shorts on. <laughs> You know, I'm popping my pecs and <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing. 
and she comes downstairs, and uh, you know we got one of those glass top ovens. You know, you know, I, you know, I love those things. They're nice, but it's a dog trying to clean them. You know, they, they, you don't have the drip pans no more. You remember the kind with the drip pan? You know, you just got the, with the eye. Sister, Sister Tina got two of them. <laughs> each side of the kitchen. But but she comes downstairs, and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, I said. Did you notice I cleaned the stove top for you? Well, I'm, I'm not a kitchen kind of guy, but you know, I said, I cleaned the oven for you, got all that clean and got all that sticky stuff off. Made it look like, it. you know me now. You know me. When I do something, I do it right. When I got done with it, it looked like they had just delivered it. Oh, it was clean. I mean, it was clean, clean. It was cleaner than yours, Sister Collins. It was clean. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Then I got down on my knees, I took the Windex and got down on the floor, you know, we had that hard wood going through the house, and I wiped over the floor, and I get down on my knees, and I said, did you notice I wiped over the floor and I cleaned off the stove for you? I wiped down the refrigerator, got it all shiny, you know, made sure there were no fingerprints and stuff on it, wiped off the dishwasher and all that. She got to look at me, and she said, yeah, you don't done some work. Did you notice, I, did, I, uh, did you notice that, and this is what she said to me, uh, did you notice I, I, I uh, washed your clothes and put them up on the dresser? <laughs> Really? <laughs> and I said to her, you know what? Doesn't it work so good when we work as a team? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do all of that, but I knew that if I would do it, it would bring joy to her. Less work she's got to do. She didn't have to do my clothes, didn't want to do that perhaps, maybe would have gotten around to it, but she went on and took care of it. It works so well when we work as a team. You know, and now so that not one or the other, the burden is neither heavy or too heavy on one or the other. We carry the load together. We work at it together. And so now she's not down there trying to do this after doing other things. I'm not some king sitting up on the throne waiting for subjects to come and serve. No, you got to humble yourself. Submit and obey your husband. But husband, love your wife. As Christ has loved the church and sacrificed and gave himself for it. Listen, let me, I'm going to finish it up right here and then I'm done. My time is done at about 12, 11, 30 or so, you know. Uh, finish it up. Listen, listen to what he said. I had a couple of other passages. I may just come back to it on, on Wednesday and, and finish it out. But I love this part of the, of the passage. So down in verse 25, he says, husbands, now we're done with the wives. You understand subjection. And remember, keep in mind the reason that most people have problems with this word, subjecting and obeying their, uh, obeying, their, obeying their husband, is because at this point they realize they married the wrong joker. Amen. Amen. He said he was a Christian, but nothing about his character demonstrates Christianity. He only said it. And coming to church doesn't make you a Christian no more than me standing inside my garage makes me a car. <laughs> You want to write that one down. You're going to need it down the road. R write that one down. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. so, so just because he said it, it, there has to be evidence of it. And you need to be wise enough to wait to make sure that what he says is real. Okay. So listen to what he says. He says in verse 25, Husband, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's sacrificial love. That's sacrificial love, brother. I can't say that enough. That's sacrificial love. Which means sometimes loving her is not just giving her flowers. That's easy. Loving her is not just doing uh, running down to Kroger and, and picking up some extra eggs, you know. She gonna cook them for you. Don't forget to get the cheese. She, she getting it for you. She, it's, oh, that's for, it's self-serving you, you know. So, it's, so sacrificial love is you giving something without anything be, thing being returned. It is to give of yourself. It is to sacrifice you, your time, your, your, your presence, your, uh, your resources, whatever it is about yourself, to give it away and expect nothing in return. And that's what Christ did. 
He loved us sacrificially. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Listen, listen. Why did he do that? This is what I want to say. And this, uh, this is, he, though he's talking to the men uh, and giving the brothers instructions, uh, it, it applies both to, to both sides, male and female. He says that he might sanctify and cleanse it and, uh, and cleanse it with the washing by the word. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the uh, wa washing of the water by the word. Listen, verse twenty-seven. That he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. What he said, what he did to the church, what he did for the church, is what you do for your homes. When you understand your roles as husbands and wives, when you subject yourself to your husband, you only make your home a beautiful home. When you love your wives as Christ loved it and, and, and sacrificed for it, you only make your house a more beautiful, unblemished, unsinful, uh, a welcoming, joyous, joyful place, a place of tranquility, a place of peace and harmony as God would have it to be. The more you two conform to the image of God, the more peace will be ensued in your house house he did what he did to make his church beautiful to present his church to himself beautiful and when you do it you make your wife beautiful in your sight here's what I'm saying her beauty her best self presents itself her best, get this now, I'm done, I'm closed. Her best self presents itself when you sacrifice. You want to get something? You can't get something from nothing. You heard it, the old record, the old writer, the old singer, I don't know who said it, but nothing from nothing, nothing from nothing, leave nothing. But you got to have something if you want to be me. Come on, y'all remember that song? The front row don't know nothing about that. Nothing from nothing, leave nothing. You gotta have something. <laughs> if you wanna be with me. <laughs> yeah, I just said it twice. Uh, you understand? <laughs> so, listen, I'm done. I'm done. When you sacrifice, you present to yourself something that is so beautiful, something that is more glorious than you will ever have. There will be no need for you crossing the aisles, going across the patio, going across the yard, looking at somebody else's stuff, viewing and eyeing somebody else's wife, uh, when you can make your own more beautiful and more glorious. But it takes work. It doesn't just happen, and it doesn't happen with her doing everything. It happens when you make sacrifices on her behalf. Then she loves you with a love you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. I wish you loved me like my mama loved her daddy. No, her love for you will be much greater than that. But you, you can never have it until you're willing to sacrifice and, and, and do what Christ has done. For his church. <laughs> Listen, that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the watching of the word, water of by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or such things, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So all men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise, will you? Yeah.